Father, we rightly confess that it's difficult at times for us to see Christ like this. We like thinking of Him as our personal Savior and as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but when you show us Christ as a divine warrior, part of our flesh rebels against that. And yet, Father, we see again and again, both in the Old and New Testament, this is the clear revelation of Jesus Christ. Your Son will come in all the glory and all the majesty, and He will judge, and He will establish His kingdom here and cast out all evil and all sin and all rebellion. I pray, Lord, that You would help me and help my brothers and sisters this morning See Christ clearly. We do not want to practice idolatry in our Christianity. We want to follow the true Jesus as you've told us who he is in your word. And so I pray to that end you would help us, Father, not only that we might know him, really know him, which is the greatest blessing of all, that we might practice as well our faith by following the Lamb of God, who is also the divine warrior. Bring clarity to this text where it is obscure. Bring encouragement, Father, I pray, to all those who have been redeemed by grace and stand in Christ and therefore are not at enmity with this divine warrior. And I ask, Lord, that if there's a soul here in this room today that does not know you, that they would hear this teaching and rightly fear him. And in that fear, I pray they would repent and be saved. Do this mighty work we ask by your Spirit. We are helpless without you, Father. We can't even worship you without you. And so do a great work, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I had a chance to listen to Kirk's sermon, and I laughed. I did. I thought, all right. Flesh-eating birds... Maybe not appropriate for Mother's Day. You know, it's really funny. I'm preparing, I'm going to be teaching a class at seminary on preaching in the fall. And so I've been working through several, several books on homiletics or preaching. And it said in there, make sure that you don't neglect Father's Day and Mother's Day. And as I'm reading, I'm thinking, flesh-eating birds, hmm, maybe, maybe. But I had already written the sermon. I thought the Holy Spirit will take care of that. Um, if you remember... Some weeks ago now, we opened up the book of Revelation and it started with John getting a vision of Jesus. And it's a parallel vision here, but it's a vision of salvation. Just listen, this is from chapter 1, verse 13. See if you remember it. Jesus is described as being clothed with a long robe. The hairs of his head were white. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. His voice was like the roar of many waters. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And then Jesus said, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. And so we started the book of Revelation with John getting a vision of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, as the Savior of mankind. And he's described in very similar fashion to what you just heard Brandon read from Revelation 19. What we want to do today, and what my my hope is the Holy Spirit will help us, that see Jesus is both the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he saves all who repent and believe, and he is the divine warrior who will come again in glory, and he will judge all evil and sin. He is both. He's not one or the other, and if he's one or the other in your mind, we want to reshape that. We want our thinking on Christ to be in line with what the Scriptures teach us about Christ. Amen? So in Revelation 19, we're now at the end of the story. Literally, we're near the end of the book, and we're at the end of God's redemptive story. Babylon, the the great prostitute, has been perfectly judged. She is no more. And and as you remember, two weeks ago, we had that great passage where we see the marriage between Jesus the groom and his bride the church, and then we have the eternal party of the wedding feast of the Lamb taking place. And so the story is over. And you say, well, if it's over, why is there in the end of chapter 19? And why do we have 20 and 21? Why do you keep going? 
because the Holy Spirit continues to circle back, does he not? He recapitulates and he reiterates. And he's been doing that now for 19 chapters, so we shouldn't be surprised. And so he draws us back now. He wants us to see who Christ really is in his fullness. And he wants us to see some details about this last day, this final judgment upon all sin. And so it's a picture of his second coming. In theology, we have a nice word for that. It's called parousia. And that's the Greek word for coming or the coming. And so the Holy Spirit wants to show us, I think, a couple things this morning. One, he wants to give us a more robust revelation of who Jesus is. Some of our pictures of Jesus are still a little baby in a manger. And that's it. That's not good. So he wants to to develop a better understanding, what we would call a Christology, um, an understanding of who Christ is. And he wants us, I think, to see that judgment and the hope that you should have as a Christian, that we should want Christ to come as a divine warrior to bring final judgment, if you're in Christ. If not, then that's not a good day for you. All right, so two things I wanna look at as we consider our passage. Number one, I want you to see Christ as God's divine warrior for justice, that he comes to exercise perfect justice, and number two, God's divine warrior for hope, that he comes to bring hope not only to you, but to all of creation, which now groans under the weight of sin. The theme of the sermon is simple. Blessed are those who see Jesus clearly and follow him faithfully. Blessed are you if you really see Christ as he truly is and follow him as he truly is. All right? Are you ready? So I I wasn't here last week. I wasn't feeling well. I got to tell you, I'm still not feeling that well. So um, forgive me if this is not presented or taught. I'm going to lean completely on the power of the Holy Spirit to help me faithfully preach and teach to you. Point number one, God's divine warrior for justice. Look at verse 11. Verse 11, then I saw, this is John speaking now, then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. So whenever we hear about the heavens being opened up, in the New Testament, that generally is a a prelude to judgment. Usually something's going to happen (coughs) and it's not necessarily a good thing. And this certainly is a prelude to judgment, but it's not just judgment, it is the judgment. It's the final judgment that God's going to be exercising upon rebellious man. And and look at what John sees here. First he sees a white horse. And now most of us, if, I'm not a horse guy, but even seeing a white horse, there's beauty to it. And there is to, an attention of beauty here, but it's more than that. It's majesty and it's glory of the one who's on it. And that is a warrior. It's not just a warrior, it's the warrior of God. So he sees him on a, this, this, this man on a white horse and he sees the name of the one sitting in the white horse and his name is Faithful and True. And you go, oh, I know, I know who that is. That's Jesus. We've already identified him as the faithful one and the true one. The one who will come and what? Vindicate God's promises and vindicate the truth. So I see the white horse. I know that it's Christ. He is the Messiah. He's coming though now as a great warrior on his white horse. And then John tells us what he's going to do, doesn't he? He's going to come in righteousness to judge and to make war. You say, no, wait a minute. That's Christ? Yes. That's my Savior? That's the Lamb? Yes. He's going to come in righteousness to judge and to make war. In fact, that's the thesis of the entire passage. The faithful and true warrior of God coming to judge and to make war. How? Righteously. Perfectly. And he can do that because he's the perfect judge. He will judge every single person perfectly. That means every single soul ever born from Adam and Eve to that last baby that's born in human history will be adjudicated perfectly, exactly as they live their life with or without Christ. And he makes war because war is the instrument of his judgment. That's how he's going to exercise his justice. And then verses 12 through 21, they elaborate this great warrior and this final battle. It tells us about who he is and what his mission is. Now as we work through these verses, I I wanna wanna pause and I want you to ask yourself a rhetorical question. And I want you to be very serious about this. Um, This is actually something that if we get wrong, it becomes very dangerous for us. Not only in the way we live, but certainly in the way we testify to Christ. Is this 
how you see and know Jesus. This divine warrior. Is that part of your Christology? You know him like that. You think of him like that. You actually rejoice at the thought, your heart rejoices at your divine warrior coming on white horse to deliver his people and judge the wicked. And if not, might you be committing idolatry of the most grievous kind? All idolatry is evil. But the supreme idolatry is the perversion of who God is, is it not? And to think that you know Christ but not know Christ would be an idolatry, I would say, worthy of judgment. Worthy of this judge exercising judgment upon you. So with those questions in mind, listen to how John sees Jesus. Look at verse 12. His eyes are like a flame of fire. We heard that, we just heard that in Revelation 1. And that means that Jesus sees and he knows everything. He sees beneath the surface. He sees behind closed doors. He knows everything. This is the perfect judge. So he not only knows what you do, but he knows why you do what you do. Every single thing for your entire life is fully known to this judge. That's why we can say when he judges, he will judge justly. He will not make a mistake. He cannot make a mistake. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Continue in verse 12. And his head, on his head are many diadems. That's a crown. That's a crown. So he's a king, which means he has the authority to exercise judgment, proper authority because he's a king. And he has the power to exercise judgment. Why? Because he's a king. So he has the authority and he has the power. Keep reading. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Now to to know someone's name in antiquity, it's, it's kind of a weird verse, especially in light of the fact that he tells us three names that are given to Christ in the very passage. To know someone's name in antiquity was to have power over them. So even though we're told that Jesus is what? He is the faithful and true one. He is the word of God. He's the king of king and lord of lords. In this passage, John is saying no one, no power, no thing in all creation has power over Christ. He is supreme. He is the sovereign. And therefore, his will will be done. And so this picture of this divine warrior, he has perfect knowledge, he has perfect power, no one can subvert his will. Is this the Jesus that you know? Is this the Jesus that you love? Keep going with me. Look at verse 13. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses lots of white horses verse 15 from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with an iron with a rod of iron he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the almighty on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written king of kings and lord of lords John sees him in a blood drenched robe now to a good test for you you immediately then go where most of us go to the crossing well that's that's his blood on the cross see that's christ his savior but that's not the picture here why do you think his robe is drenched in blood because he is treading the wine press of god almighty it is the blood of his enemies that's covering him it's covering him to the point where not a single inch of his white robe remains white That is his fury, that is his wrath, and that is why he is covered in blood. John then tells us his name is the Word of God. My beloved, that is so profound, we could go for hours on it and and tie directly into John chapter 1, when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But it simply means this, I think in its most profound sense, that Christ is the message of God. Christ, Jesus Christ, is the message of God. We have so much revelation in the Word, in the Bible, but the ultimate revelation is Jesus. It is the Son. And it is the revelation that what? That all who repent and put their faith in Him will be saved by Him, and all who remain in rebellion will what? Will be judged by Him. He is the consummation of the message of God Almighty. Is this not what Jesus said of Himself? John chapter 3, verse 18 Jesus said, whoever believes in him, speaking of himself, is not condemned, 
But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. He refuses to believe in the Word of God. He is Savior and he is Judge. But it's not just the fact that Jesus is the Word of God. John tells us that it's the Word itself that will be used to judge the nations. Look at verse 15. It says, from his, speaking of Jesus' mouth, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Now, you know that sword. You know the sword is the word. So what's coming out of his mouth is the word of God. With which to strike down the nations, he will rule them with a rod of iron. He'll have absolute authority. No rebellion in this particular state. Perfect rule. The word of God, the word of truth is proclaimed even today. And it has the power to strike down nations, does it not? It has the power to transform hearts and minds from the least to the greatest. It's the word that has been going out since Genesis chapter 3, that God is a holy God, that man is truly fallen through and through, that salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. It's the word that has gone out through the centuries, that repentance and faith is the only way to be saved, and if you remain in rebellion against the divine warrior, your end will be destruction. The same word that's gone out for centuries is the word that's proclaimed today. It's the word that Jesus will use when he comes again in glory. And everybody will know it's true because it is the word of God. And here it is the final word. There'll be no more proclamation of salvation and judgment after this point because this is the end. This is the very end of the story. He will come with the sword from his mouth and he will come, did you notice, with an army. You say, well, who is that army made up of? Look at verse 14. So he's riding this fantastic figure of Jesus Christ on this white horse, verse 14, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, so they're brilliant and beautiful too, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Lots of white, lots of purity, lots of justice. Well, who's in this army? Well, the the commentators say it's one of two things or both. They say it's the 144,000. It's the church. It's God's people coming back with Christ to put evil and sin to death. I like that. I like that thought. Is that not an incredible thought that one day we're going to be looking around and we're going to see each other and we're going to be in fine linen and we're going to be on white horses and we're going to be following Christ in? Uh, You don't like that thought? I love that thought. We'll be waving at each other, carrying our swords. Some say it's angels. Um, I I think it's actually both. I think it's the saints and the angels coming together with Christ to establish his reign, his kingdom on earth, and put all evil and all sin and all rebellion down. Now you need to know that the descriptions that John uses to describe Jesus as this divine warrior, almost every single one comes from the Old Testament. It's too many to delineate here without you getting angry with me for going way, way too long. But I want you to understand that in the Old Testament, it was understood when when the Jews thought of their Messiah, they thought of a divine warrior, much more so than a suffering servant from Isaiah 53. That's the Christian mentality primarily. And what I want to do is I want to bring those two together so that there's harmony between the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and the divine warrior of God. So prophesied to again and again and again from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the New Testament that he is this divine warrior. So again, I ask you, is this the Jesus that you know and love? Is this the Jesus that you pray to and meditate on and talk about? When you tell people about Jesus, is it just the Lamb of God who was slain upon the cross? Or do you talk about him coming again in glory? Do you talk about his judgment and his power and his authority with friends and family who have never heard about the true Jesus? Are you eager for him to come back? Like this. This real divine warrior. Or do you have some other convoluted picture of Christ in your mind? You know, he's been... I would say, the most confused figure in all of human history. Probably without question. I would say no one even comes close. Right? If you remember when, when Jesus was actually incarnate and he was teaching his disciples, remember he asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And the people were totally off. Matthew 16, 14. Some say you're John the Baptist, who was dead, come back to life. 
Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So even in the time when Christ was here, they did not know who he was. In the, in the history of the early church, most of you know that it took a few centuries for us to get a, a handle on Jesus Christ and what is known as the hypostatic union, that we believe that Jesus is, was, is, truly human and truly God, simultaneously, perfectly. So confusion for several hundred years and certainly a lot of confusion over who he is today. Today, there are a lot of people who don't even think that Jesus ever existed. Now that's just bad history. That's just bad history. But the majority of people actually will say today, at least in the United States, they'll say that he existed, that he was a real historical figure, but that he was not God, he was not God's son, and he is not the savior of the world. So they'll, they'll have an idea of who he is, but not really who he is. Now in the context of the Western church, we, we again, we like to think of Jesus in particular ways. We like to think of him as our personal savior. Not the savior of the church, just my personal savior. Which he is, but he's also the savior of the church. Better put, he's the savior of the church and you're part of that. That's a little bit better, I think. We like to think of Jesus, we do, we like to think of Jesus as that little baby in the manger on Christmas Day. And we like to think of Jesus as that on the Good Friday when he ascended the cross and he gave his life. And we love to think about Jesus being raised from the dead on the third day when we celebrate Easter. We love to think about all those things. But how about here? How about this? Thinking of him as a divine warrior. Did you get the picture? A horse riding, crown wearing, war making, blood spilling, iron rod wielding executioner of God's wrath. That's Christ. That's your savior. Is that how you see him? My beloved, our savior will be the greatest executioner of all time. Did you know that? the greatest executioner of all time. Is that the Jesus you know and love? Is that the Jesus that you are following? If not, then you're either ignorant to the word of God, which is great because you're here and you're gonna learn, or you know, but you don't wanna look and you don't wanna believe that. Now that's dangerous. Knowing what is true and not accepting what is true, knowing what the word of God says, but rejecting the word of God, well, that's, that's dangerous because what is it? When Jesus comes, what is he going to use to judge? He's going to use the sword of his mouth. He's going to use the word to judge. So if you are rejecting the word of God, what? He may judge you. We have no right to reject God's word. We have no reje- right to reject the full counsel of God's word. It's God's word. Who are we to say, no, I like that, I I don't like that. I'll keep this piece, but I'll reject this piece. I like Jesus as my Savior, but I hate the thought of him as a divine warrior. We have no right to do that. So why do we do that? Two questions I want to ask before going to our next point. One, why do we struggle so much seeing Jesus as this blood-soaked warrior of God? Why? And number two, How does this struggle impact our ability to follow him faithfully? Why do we struggle seeing him as a divine warrior? And what impact does that have on us following Christ? I think significant. I really do. Especially after meditating on this passage for two weeks now. First, I believe we struggle seeing Jesus as God's divine warrior because we don't see sin and our willful disobedience of God clearly against God clearly. We don't see it. We don't see sin clearly. We don't see our rebellion against God clearly. The Bible teaches clearly that all sin, first and foremost, is against who? It's against God, first and foremost. Every single sin that we commit is rebellion against our Creator. It's spitting in His face. It's laughing at His laws. It's mocking His rule. It's denying Him the glory He deserves from you, an image bearer. So we don't see it clearly. Sin is also, we know it's ruinous to his creation. It destroys everything from the inside out. Sin destroys relationships, families, careers, nations. It is the poison, my beloved, that infects all of God's good creation. Sin is. But because we don't see sin like this, the Bible calls sin as what? Utterly sinful. Because we don't see it as being grievous and rebellious against God, ruinous to creation, deserving of judgment, we think Christ coming as divine warrior unreasonable. 
I mean, this seems extreme. He seems too harsh. It seems like an overreaction to a broken world. Maybe he should be more moderate. Maybe he should have compassion on those who continue in their rebellion. We struggle with it, I think, because we don't see the heinousness of sin. And so we don't like the thought of a divine warrior coming to judge. We don't like it. And because we don't see it as utterly sinful, my beloved, I believe we're not as inclined to fight against the sin in our own lives. It manifests and we don't put it to death quickly because we're not thinking divine warrior. We're thinking Lamb of God, He'll forgive me. I can keep sinning. He'll forgive me. Grace will abound. We don't fight against the sin as we ought. We certainly, I don't think, strive to submit to all of the word of God, the full counsel of God. Every single command and every single precept revealed in the Bible, we are expected as his people to what? To know and to do. It's not okay to be ignorant of God's word, especially today, especially today where we all are Bible-toting Christians. It was Jesus, listen, the divine warrior, who said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20 in the Great Commission, he said this, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe what? All that I commanded you. Not some, not part, but all. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? Say it. If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments, not some of my commandments, not part of my commandments, but all my commandments. In fact, the Apostle John, before he wrote the book of Revelation, probably one of the more difficult letters in all the New Testament, listen to what he said in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. John said, listen, and, and ask yourself, is this me? By this we know that we've come to know him if we, what? Keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, John says, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Those are really, really hard words, my beloved. Spoken in the context of the gospel of grace, but equally true. Now, I want to be, be really clear with you and real simple on this point because I don't want there to be any confusion. The Bible does not teach that we can be perfect on this side of heaven. It does not teach that. This is not perfection in this state. In fact, John also said a few verses earlier, 1 John chapter 1, if we claim to be without sin, what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So perfection is not going to be had here. At the same time, the Bible clearly teaches, listen, if you've been saved by grace and you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit and you have the word of God and the church, brothers and sisters, to help you in this faith, then there is an expectation for you to pursue obedience in all of life. You can't say, I'm going to pursue you here and not here. I'm going to pursue you in my marriage, but not at work. I'm going to pursue you at church, but not in my neighborhood. There's no such Christianity, my beloved. That's partial obedience. The true Christian will strive to know the whole counsel of God, the word of God, and live in accordance with it. The true Christian will not be okay knowingly and willfully disobeying God's word. Now this may sound obvious to you, but I, I do believe, listen, I do believe the Western church has made it an art of partial obedience. I think the Western church has mastered partial obedience in what we teach and what we preach and in how we live as Christians. And I pray this does not sound harsh but I was really struggling with this passage in reflection of our church and the church here in the West. I'll give you some examples. In a so-called healthy church, maybe you're gonna follow a nine marks model, in a so-called healthy church today, most healthy churches will require prospective members to honor the Lord's day by gathering. And if a member ceases to gather on a regular basis, they'll go to Hebrews chapter 10 and they'll say, thou shalt not forsake the gathering of the saints. They'll even hold members accountable, potentially through Matthew 18 and church discipline, if you begin to forsake regularly. And yet those same churches, listen, when it comes to the very basic one another in commands given in the Bible, 
Love one another. Be devoted to one another. Carry one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Build one another up. These same churches are seemingly okay with these basic one another commands being optional. In other words, the implicit teaching is this. Make sure you come to church, but it's okay if you have nothing to do with your brothers and sisters in church. Make sure you show up on a Sunday, but there's no requirement to love one another as Christ loves us. Now, be really careful. If I had to, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, but if I were, I think if you had to put those two on a scale and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do more? Do you want to make sure that I love my brothers and sisters and carry their burdens and serve them and sacrifice or show up on Sunday? I think he's going to pick the former. He wants us to do both. But I think it would be our care for one another. Most healthy churches will put a a member under church discipline if they do not repent for adultery or stealing from their employer or divorcing their spouse without biblical reason. They'll they'll practice church discipline. And yet many of those same churches seem to be fine with their members who claim to be witnesses of Christ but never testifying, never sharing the gospel, never making disciples, and never using their gifts and talents for the glory of God and building the church. This is confusing to me, my beloved. We're told we, we will hold a Christian accountable for drunkenness, but not coveting, for dissentiousness in the body, but not for neglecting to train up their children in the faith. We'll hold a Christian accountable for pornography, but not for making an idol out of work or school or entertainment. What's my point? Partial obedience to the word of God is disobedience to the word of God. It's that simple. Willfully, knowingly, disobeying the word of God puts us in great danger. James chapter 2, verse 11. For he who said do not commit adultery, speaking of God, also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law, of the whole law. Hebrews chapter 10, you know this, we did this. One of the more, I think, convicting and hard passages in the Bible. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That's the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. You know that. That's the divine warrior coming to judge. Those in the church who live lives of willful, partial obedience. If you are making a practice of sin in your life, you know the word and you do some, but you don't do the others and you don't intend on doing the others, then it makes sense you don't want to see Christ as the divine warrior. It makes sense you don't want him to come back as this this, this sword-wielding executioner because you're still in rebellion against him and that day will be your day of judgment, not salvation. I think that's one reason we struggle so much in the Western church. There's another reason, though, and it's actually the flip side of it. The first reason is we struggle with licentiousness. We keep on sinning, saying that grace will abound. The other one is that I think we struggle seeing Christ, the divine warrior, wanting him to come back because we struggle with the understanding of the gospel itself. We miss the gospel. Deep down, we still don't get the gospel that someone is saved by grace through faith, period. Nothing that you can do. You say, well, how does this cause me to struggle with Christ as a divine warrior? If you don't understand that, if you don't understand the very core of your spiritual being, that it's God who saves you by grace and there's nothing that you did to be saved, are doing to be saved, or will do to be saved, then you don't understand the gospel. And so what do you do? You think about Christ coming back as divine warrior and you're thinking, I'm not ready. I need to do more work. I need to be better. I need to be more holy. I need to confess more sin. I need to be a better son or daughter or mother or father. We all know. If you know Christ, you know. You know your just desert. You know you committed enough sins this morning to be cast into eternal hell. You know that. If you know Christ, you know that. But rather than being secure 
in the salvation imparted to us freely by grace through faith, rather than us resting and rejoicing in the completed work of Christ on the cross, and then what? And then walking in righteousness because we are saved. We keep working. And so the thought of the divine warrior is a very terrible thought to us. And we cower thinking, I'm not ready. We wrongly think we're not holy enough, we're not righteous enough, and when that day comes, he's going to condemn me. It's a failure of the gospel, at least in our understanding of it. Friends, listen, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save you, if you've been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, and there is fruit in your life, however meager that fruit may be, if there's fruit in your life and the Spirit dwelling in you, then you can see Jesus as John did. You can see him as this divine warrior coming to execute his perfect wrath in all his fury, his blood-drenched robe. You can come, you can see him like that, and you cannot be afraid. Why? Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You can not only not be afraid, my beloved, but you can see him and you can know him and you can love him as he truly is. And that's what we want most, is it not? I mean, if it's Christ that we want most, we want to see him and know him and love him. We don't want this big blind spot. You want to love Christ as a lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and the divine warrior who will come again in glory and cast all evil out of the world. You want him as both because he is both. We want to worship him correctly because he is Savior and he's judge. I was thinking as we were singing our songs today, we don't have enough songs written about Christ as divine warrior. I mean, we just don't. I mean, maybe they they were there at one point in time, but we don't sing them. Here comes Christ, drenched in blood, carrying his sword, Slaying the nations. Maybe people wouldn't stay if we sang songs like that. I don't know. Uh, Andrew Peterson, he actually, he wrote a song called The Reckoning. And he talks about the, the parousia, the second coming of Christ. And he talks about Jesus in, in a much more robust way than we sing. Listen, this is just a piece of the lyric. He's writing about Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, you are holiness and grace. Listen. You are fury and and rest, you are anger and love, you curse and you bless, you are mighty and weak, you are silence and song, you are plain as the day, but you have hidden your face. And he says, how long, how long, how long until you come back? That's more accurate. A full understanding of Jesus as Savior and Judge. That's why the vision's here. That's what John wants us to know. Do you know it now? Give me an amen if you say, yes, I do. I didn't ask if you liked it. I said, do you know it now? Do you understand and see, if you don't see Christ clearly as a divine warrior, then you will not take sin seriously. You may pervert the gospel. Neither of those are good. Can I show you one more here? Second point? Yes. If you said no, I'm still going to preach, so it doesn't really matter, right? (laughs) I don't know why I asked that rhetorical question for you. Uh, Point number two, God's divine warrior for hope. So we see him as a divine warrior for justice, but, but it's not just justice. As a Christian, you want to hear this, and it should cultivate a deep hope and encouragement in your heart and mind because he's coming. He's coming for you. He's coming for you. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 picks up explaining how the warrior is going to judge and make war on a rebellious creation. Right. So we get this picture of who he is, and then we pick up in 17 and we see how he's going to do what he's going to do. Verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and that, that, that means that it reveals the glory of this angel. This is a pretty glorious angel. He's standing in the sun. He's being magnified in that way. And with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. The birds that fly directly overhead are the birds of the earth. More specifically, they are flesh-eating birds, eagles, hawks, falcons, vultures, birds that feed on flesh. Latter part of verse 17. The angel says, come, he's speaking to them, come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. All, listen, this is really important for next week, all mankind, anyone who remains in rebellion against Christ is going to be judged and consumed, okay? All mankind. So the birds are summoned to feast 
on all those who are going to wage war against God. Now, you probably, if you remember two weeks ago, there's a parody that the vision that's coming to John, it's playing upon the wedding supper of the Lamb. Remember that? The wedding supper of the Lamb, Christ comes and he gathers the redeemed and he sets them at the table after the wedding ceremony and they feast and they enjoy one another. It's a glorious picture. And here, it's not the wedding feast of the Lamb, it's the feast of God. And all those who are being gathered are what? They're being gathered to to be eaten. They are the meal. Now, I don't have to tell you, my beloved, which one you should want to be at. You want to be at the wedding feast of the Lamb where you get to eat and commune with Christ himself and not someone who remains in rebellion and is the meal itself. Now, it's a particularly gruesome picture, right? These are, if you've ever watched, if you ever watched like a vulture or a, or a hawk pick flesh off bone, right? Well, this is, this is the flesh of man. These are the bones of men. This picture of, of their flesh being picked off and, and torn away and the birds eating it. It is a, a gruesome picture of the small and the great who reject Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, in the ancient world, to not be buried was a, a great dishonor in the first century Mediterranean culture. To not be buried was a great dishonor. And to have your flesh eaten post-mortem by animals was one of the greatest disgraces that could happen to you. Right? So you see the picture here. It's not that we're literally going to be eaten by birds. It's that the end for those who remain in rebellion against God will be one of dishonor, disgrace, and eternal torment. That's the picture that's being painted here. One that should cause all those that do not know Christ to repent. So there's a, there's a war that's taking place here, but it's a, it's a fool's war. Look at verse 19. And I saw the beast, remember the beast, and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And he said, now wait a minute, I thought, I thought in, in Revelation 16, didn't we deal with Armageddon? The answer is yes, it's the same battle. We're not doing this sequentially over time. We're recapitulating, we're retelling the story. It's the same battle, same rebellion against God. In this particular case, it's rebellion against all the kings and the nations and the peoples against specifically the divine warrior Jesus Christ and his army, which might include you, okay? But what's interesting here, and you probably noticed this, it's just, it doesn't make for a great story. I mean, this is the great battle of Armageddon, right? The kings and the nations and the peoples rebelling against the divine warrior, and here comes Christ on his white horse with his army of angels and the church, and they're coming, and you're expecting this clash. It's so anticlimactic, it's almost comical. Look at verse 20. And the beast, the beast, remember, represents all governments and authorities in rebellion against God. The beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, and the, the false prophet, remember, the second beast, who was the propaganda machine for the first beast. The beast and the false prophet, these two were told, were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And you're like, that's it? Where are the details? I mean, where are the battles? They're taking place here. The beast and the false prophet are and I, and I believe this is intentional, they are easily overthrown by Christ. Easily. It's Christ. It's God. Right? I don't even know why the army came other than to experience and magnify the glory of Christ defeating the kings and the nations and the people that were in rebellion against him. They just picks them up and he throws them into the eternal lake of fire. And that's it. We're done. In fact, the Apostle Paul, if you remember, when he was writing to the church in Thessalonica, he's reassuring them about the power of Christ to overcome the enemies of the church. Listen to what, how Paul describes how easy it is for Jesus. This is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth. He will breathe, and they're destroyed, bringing to nothing by the appearance of his coming. When he comes, he will breathe, he will speak, and they will be laid to waste. Now that's, if you've been with us for these past several weeks, that's an amazing statement. I mean, we've seen the beast, the dragon who is Satan. We've seen the beast, these demonic governments. We've seen the second beast, the, these false prophets that are the propaganda. We've seen them exercise incredible power, have we not? Subduing the nations, ruling over mankind. We've seen them persecute the church. 
And here we're told that those once so powerful kings and nations and peoples that were against God are laid to waste by God in a single breath, in a single word. All those who had the mark of the beast on them. And all those who followed were told in verse 21 will suffer the exact same shame. So those who align themselves with the beast or the false prophet, same shame. Look at verse 21. And the rest were slain by the sword. That's the word of God that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. That's Christ, the divine warrior. And all the birds were gorged. That, they, were, they were filled up with their flesh. It's graphic, isn't it? There was so much food to eat because there was so much rebellion against God. The birds had their fill. It is a, it is a picture that is intended to be catastrophic and gruesome and the power of the divine warrior to execute God's justice with a breath or a word. There is no battle. There's no real battle. Christ has already won that battle upon the cross. And so for those who are here, again, as I prayed at the very beginning, it, this should elicit, if you do not know Christ, or if you're not sure if you know Christ, or if you might be one of those partial obedient Christians, I do some things but I don't do other and I'm okay with that, this should elicit great fear because you're going to be one of those following the beast or the false prophet into that battle of Armageddon. Your end will be disgrace, dishonor, and eternal torment. You say, what, what if I do know Christ? How's this battle good for me? One word, hope. Great hope now and an incredible hope for your future. You see, my friends, if you, if you know Christ as Lord and Savior, then you want to know him as God's divine warrior. You don't want to leave that out, not only because it's, it's true, but you don't, want to, you don't want to not know Christ as that divine warrior for you, for you right now. The Son of Man, the Bible says, is not against you. He is for you. So this divine warrior, he is here now through the power of his Holy Spirit, if you know him, to fight with you and to fight for you, and sometimes to fight for you when you can't fight for yourself. When you're done fighting and you lay down and you say, no more, Lord, he fights on your behalf. My first thought was, He's like the ultimate superhero, is he not? I mean, he's it. He is the guy. He's the one that will come, and any battle that you're in, big or small, he will fight for you, and he will fight with you. But I don't like superhero because that takes us to like Avengers mode. I, I like better, he's the divine husband, as we looked at two weeks ago. He's your husband, and he will come, and he will encourage you, and he will fight for you, and he will nourish you, and he will cherish you, and he will never let you be overcome. That's better, I think. That's better for me. I don't need the Avengers in my mind. I want a divine husband in my mind thinking of Christ like this. If you have him like this, then he, he should bring the greatest hope. The person, remember? He is the message. The person of Jesus Christ should bring you the greatest hope in your times of greatest need. That this divine warrior is with you, fighting for you. That, now that's real, my beloved. This is, not, this is not religious metaphor. This is not something we say to appease heavy consciences. If Christ is able to defeat the beast and the prophet and their armies with a breath, don't you think he's able to fight for you and win for you? I mean, honestly, we're talking, the beast and the prophet were, were supernaturally empowered by Satan himself. And it was a breath, it was a word, and they were slain. Is there any problem in your life bigger than that? I don't think so. It doesn't matter what it is and how dire it is for you. Christ with his word, Christ with a breath, can slay any struggle. So you say, no, you don't know, Pastor. My marriage is in shambles. Christ will fight for your marriage. You say, you don't know what I'm battling with physically right now. I'm, I'm struggling. I may be dying physically. Christ will fight that battle with you and for you. Jesus person, the real person. You see, you don't understand. All my friends, I used to have lots of friends before I came to Christ. I come to Christ. I don't have any friends. I'm lonely. Christ fights that loneliness for you. 
he is there with you. When you say, you know, I feel like the whole world is just coming down on me, and I look at my future, and it does not look bright. My beloved, if you're in Christ, there's only brightness. <laughs> only brightness. Doesn't matter what happens on this side, because your end is glory. Christ will be with you. He will fight for you. Do you remember? Of course you do. Matthew chapter 28. Same passage, great commission, when he teaches the disciples to go and said, teach them all that I commanded. Do you remember what else he said? He said, lo, I will be with you, what? Always, even to the end of the age. Oh, there, there are very few verses in all sacred scripture more comforting than that. The disciples needed to hear that because he said, I'm leaving. And they're like, you can't leave, right? But we know that he left and he sent the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ dwells in us. So you actually can't get away from Jesus if you're in Jesus. You can't get away from the divine warrior because the divine warrior is with you and in you every moment of every day. You can fool yourself in thinking that you have, but you actually cannot. When Jesus faced and defeated our fiercest enemies on the cross, namely Satan and sin and death, my beloved, he, he not only paid your penalty for sin, giving you access back into heaven, back into the presence of God. But his victory, his victory over Satan and sin and death and the beast and the false prophet and all the temptation of the flesh, that was given to you freely by grace through faith. He just hands it to you. And he says, here's my victory. Now be victorious too. And we can be in him. We're equipped with his word. We are equipped with the Holy Spirit. Listen, we are equipped. You know who you are? We're the army of God. We're equipped with brothers and sisters who are fully armed right now. You want to talk about the power of the church to help one another walk this faith as an army of God? That means we can experience victory over every single battle, no matter how that battle turns out. Do you know that? The marriage may end. Your body may perish your world may be turned upside down and your future here may not be that bright. But it doesn't matter because Christ has won for you and he's given you that victory freely by grace through faith in him. He's defeated the enemies. He's, he's done all the heavy lifting for us. We don't have to do that work. Every enemy, no matter how powerful it may seem to you, is felled with a single word from your divine warrior, Jesus Christ. Knowing him, having this accuracy, is, it's not only imperative so we can have hope in a day-to-day -day basis, especially when it's hard, but, but there's, there's one more here and I, I want to give you and I'm going to close. You got to know, you got to know that Christ is the divine warrior or this story does not end well. Right, we've been talking about God's creation, fall, redemption, restoration story now for, what, 35 weeks. Well, if Christ is not the divine warrior that the Bible teaches, there is no good ending to this story. One of the promises, if you remember, very early in the Bible, one of the promises that God made to Abraham was to give Abraham what? A piece of land. A lasting possession. I'll read it to you. This is Genesis 17, verse 8. God's making his covenant with Abraham, the father of God's people. God says to Abraham, I, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. Of course, that was for Israel in the Old Testament. But then he says, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. You think, well, wait a minute. That's not how the history of Israel went. It's not an everlasting possession. They were engaged in wars and battles. They were cast out. They came back. And then we know in 70 AD, Jerusalem was laid to waste and the temple was destroyed and the people of Israel were no more, at least not geographically speaking. So how did God fulfill this promise? After all, his name is what? Faithful and true. He cannot lie and he cannot go against something that he promised. The prophet Ezekiel actually gave us a prophecy telling us the answer to this everlasting possession. This is from Ezekiel 23. God said this, listen, this is a beautiful passage. He said, my people shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them 
and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord. You see the picture that's being painted. The promise that was made to Abraham, the prophecy given to Ezekiel, was a place, a real geographic place, where there was no more danger, no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more insecurity, where God will dwell with his people forever. You say, well, if it's not the Middle East, then where is it? It's here, right here. You say, San Jose, no, the earth. The entire earth is the land that was promised to Abraham. I don't think Abraham had any idea that promise that was made, the magnitude of Genesis 17. The entire earth is to be the dwelling place of God and man. You say, well, that's a, that's a glorious truth, but this earth isn't so good. It's not this earth. It's going to be a renovated earth. It's going to be a new earth that Christ makes new by doing what? By being a divine warrior. You see, if you don't have Christ as a divine warrior in your Christology, then the end of this story doesn't end well. But if you do, Christ does what? He comes and he cleanses the earth. He cleanses the palate. Not in some weird green way. He literally cleanses all sin and all evil. Every demon, every beast, every false prophet, every single person who rebels against God is judged by God and cast where? Cast in the lake of fire. Off the earth. Incredible. And he does that so that the promise of Abraham might be fulfilled as what? An everlasting possession. God's people get the earth. God's people get God dwelling with them on the earth. This will be our eternal home. Now we're going to see this in the next few chapters when we talk about the kingdom of heaven coming down to earth. I know some of you think that you're going to spend eternity in heaven Technically, you will not, if you're thinking geographically, you're going to spend eternity, Lord willing, on earth with Christ when heaven comes down to earth. We'll get there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, though, this should have been a clue to you. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said what? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? They shall inherit the earth, the whole earth, not this fallen earth, but a restored earth, cleansed and made new by God's divine warrior That's your new home. That's what your heart longs for most. It really does. It longs for that place where there is no more fear, there is no more anxiety, there's no more struggling day to day, toiling with the battle of sin and just trying to make it through life. That place of true rest, that true peace here with God, with Christ. This is the promise that was made to Abraham. This is the promise that satisfied with Christ as the divine warrior. You want him as your divine warrior. Friends, you've got to make room in your Christology for a Christ who not only saves but judges. You've got to make room to not see Jesus clearly as the divine warrior may lead to licentiousness, you not taking sin seriously. It may lead to legalism, you not embracing the gospel. To not see Christ clearly means you will not take advantage of the power you have right now in Christ, your divine warrior, to fight for you and to fight with you when it's hard. And you can't even have an end to your story. All evil, my beloved, will be eradicated, taken away, and punished forever in the lake of fire so that God can gather his people and dwell in this place as he intended from the beginning. It is a glorious picture, my beloved. This is the work of the divine warrior. This is why we can truly say, blessed are those who see Jesus clearly and follow him faithfully. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this picture, this accurate depiction of Christ as the divine warrior. I ask, Lord, that you would realign our hearts and minds to embrace this truth. For those here who do not know Christ, I pray that this would cause them to repent and believe. For those that do, I pray, Lord, it would bring them great hope. 
that they would see, Father, that Christ is our friend. And if he is for us, Lord, then truly no one can be against us. Give us that clarity today, Father, that we might mortify sin in our life, that we might live and breathe in the gospel of grace. Give us that clarity, I, I pray right now, Father, that, uh, that we see Christ as this divine word so that we can go to him every moment of every day, especially when we're in times of need, and we know that as our divine word, he will be fighting for us, that he truly will not leave us. And give us that hope, Lord, of that day when you do make this place your home, when you cleanse this planet of all sin and evil and you gather your people from the four corners of the earth to dwell with us, Father. Encourage us with that, I pray. What a great encouragement. What a great encouragement for us today, your people. In Christ's name, amen.